live long and prosper. So in this video series, I'm going to be talking through the social justice elements of every episode of the original series of Star Trek. Um, the thing that inspired this project was actually a Fox News article which argued that Star Trek has in some way betrayed its traditional commitment to sort of political neutrality or middle ground by embracing progressive politics. In this series, we're going to see that Star Trek has always embraced progressive politics and it's always been aspirational for social justice in various senses. Um, I am taking a broad perspective on social justice here, um, so that may, that may include multiple different types of uh, social justice, whether that's racial, whether that's economic, whether that's religious, whether that's abilities, gender and sexuality, um, anything, anything broadly considered. Um, I will go through every episode. Some of the episodes I will, I will interview fellow Trekkies and talk with them about it. Um, and then below, uh, in the descriptions, I will give you additional information about the episodes, particularly uh, their original air date, who wrote the the, uh, the screenplay, and who uh, directed that episode. I also want to dedicate this series to my dad, Michael Allen Zapkin. Uh, he was an OG Trekkie from back in the day, and uh, it was watching the original series with him that I came to love Star Trek. In this video, we're going to talk about the episode Operation Annihilate, which is the season finale for Star Trek's original series, Season 1! Uh, before we talk about the episode, uh, I do want to make an announcement. I have a very, uh, very busy fall semester in 2022 coming up, so I'm going to put this series on hold. I will return uh, back to the, the Star Trek videos around sometime around mid-December 2022, for those of you who've been following this series in real time. Um, my cat is screaming. I don't know if the, the mic is going to pick that up, but sorry. Um, but I will be putting the series on hold. Uh, I will come back to it. But for the moment, you've got all of Season 1 up, and I will come back to, to Season 2 later on. Thank you. So, Operation Annihilate. Uh, um, this is the first of a set of not very good season finales we have with Star Trek. Um, the Season 2 finale, uh, which is called Assignment Earth, is also not particularly good. Um, Operation Annihilate is not fantastic. It's not the worst episode, but they don't exactly go out on a high note. So basically what happens is there's been a series of civilizations that have been destroyed in a line across space. And they've been destroyed over a fairly long period of time um, by complete massive madness. Just everybody goes nuts, they become extraordinarily violent, they destroy each other, etc., etc. Nobody knows what's going on, and now another civilization, or an, specifically another colony, uh, the Deneva colony, has begun to be infected. Uh, not only is this a problem because there's a million inhabitants of the Deneva colony, but Kirk's brother Sam and his family live on Deneva. So the stakes are very high for Kirk personally. So again, nobody knows what's been going on. So Kirk, Spock, uh, McCoy, and some crew members beam down to try and figure out what's going on. While they are there, they do find Kirk's sister-in-law and nephew uh, badly injured. She ends up dying on the ship. The nephew never gets a speaking part, so he got paid less money. Uh, Kirk's brother is dead. And, while they're there, Spock gets attacked by a flying space amoeba. Which, 
was possibly made out of plastic bomb. Uh, they're just sort of like these roughly dinner plate shape or roughly dinner plate size things that are sort of pinkish with some what appear to be some veins and some throbby bits, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, and they fly very awkwardly on wires and whatnot. Uh, so Spock gets attacked by one. It lands on his back. It injects him with its tentacles and tendrils and whatnots, which twine their way throughout his central nervous system, um, basically trying to take control of him. Fortunately, uh, the Enterprise crew has one big clue for how to defeat the space amoebas, uh, and that is that when they were arriving in Denovan space, a Denovan had flown his spaceship into the sun, and at the last moment before he burned up, he was like, I'm free! So they reason that something, some characteristic of the sun has to have killed the creature without necessarily killing the human host. They go through a bunch of tests, radiation, heat, pressure, none of it works. Until Kirk is finally like, ah, the sun also produces light. We'll try light on it. Um, and so they set a light chamber to the the light of the sun, a million candles per square inch, I think is the, the, met, uh, the measurement that they use. They blast the creature. Spock has gone down and captured one. They blast the creature, and it's like, well, I'm dead now. So uh, they decide, all right, we will put Spock into that chamber, and we will blast him with the light of the sun. McCoy is kind of like, maybe we should do some more tests. But Kirk and Spock are like, no, no more tests. Stick me in the chamber. So they do that. Uh, they open the door, and Spock is like, the creature is gone. Also, I'm blind. So, now, Kirk has managed to avoid the conundrum of if we can't if we can't stop the creatures, we will have to destroy the planet to prevent them from escaping and getting to the next uh, set of civilizations. So he no longer has to kill a million people. Now he has to blind a million people, which I suppose is marginally better. But then Nurse Chapel comes in, like literally 12 seconds after Spock is blinded. And she's like, here's the results of the test on the first creature. And McCoy's like, oh shit, I didn't have to blind Spock. I literally did not have to use the full spectrum of light, including the light that actually did the blinding. Spock is blind for nothing now. So they set up a bunch of satellites in orbit. They blast down the light that will kill the creatures, but not blind every human person on Deneva. And they win. Yay! Deneva is free. So, this is not, this is another not especially social justice heavy episode. Um, there, there's a lot of things that don't make that much sense that have some sorts of social justice connections without being necessarily strong elements of social justice um, or strong concerns, considerations. So one of the, the issues that's raised here is medical testing. This is an issue that we've seen before in Star Trek. Um, it, issues with uh, McCoy testing serums on his himself, um, other other different problematic medical uh, medical practices, experimental practices, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. McCoy does say we should do more tests on on these creatures before we blast the entire planet with a massive amount of blinding light. And Kirk and Spock are like. No, we don't need more tests. We've found out that the creatures can be killed. Methodologically, that is not fantastic at all. Um, and literally the fact that like 12 seconds after 
Spock is blinded. Nurse Chapel comes in and is like, oh, BT Dubs, here's the actual test results that you didn't fucking wait for before you stuck Spock in that chamber. Like, incidentally, Spock is not permanently blinded because apparently Vulcans have an inner eyelid to deal with the brightness of their sun. So he's just temporarily blinded, which is kind of a cop-out as far as solving that problem, but when you're in the last minute of the episode, you kind of have to figure something out there. Anyway, like, as an experimental procedure, as a medical practice, it's incredibly bad. Like, you do tests, you run a set of tests to actually figure out which variables are important and which are not. And, again, McCoy to his credit, wants to do this and is overruled by Kirk and Spock. So there's that element of it. Um, another element is the utilitarian question, which has, again, come up before in previous episodes. Um, because Spock does and and again this is another time where we have that triad of Kirk Spock and McCoy functioning in a specific way um Spock represents the sort of cold logic McCoy represents less logical sort of humanity or humanism and then Kirk is the sort of synthesis of these when they are discussing what to do to prevent these space amoebas from getting beyond Deneva, Spock is like, if we have to kill everybody on this planet, including myself and Kirk's nephew, who's still alive, but is unconscious, that sucks, but that's what we would have to do. McCoy is like, killing a million people is unacceptable. The, the logic of it's better to kill five people to save ten is unacceptable. And Kirk is like, give me a third alternative. I refuse to accept either that we let these space amoebas go about their merry way, or that we kill everybody on this planet. I demand a third alternative. So again, you've got that sort of dialectic structure of thesis, antithesis, and synthesis between Spock, McCoy, and Kirk. Um, but that utilitarian question comes up over and over and over again in Star Trek, in part because it is a real-world challenge. Like, the difficulties of making decisions and the negative outcomes that, that often come from them, the, the logic of sacrifice is in some way a utilitarian one. And then the last big social justice uh, consideration that I see really in this episode is that they determined that the space amoebas are not individual creatures. They're more like single brain cells that are part of a larger interconnected organism. They function on some sort of telepathic system. But the Enterprise crew then makes no attempt whatsoever to try and communicate with this larger organism. They simply accept that they can destroy it. And that's an incredibly problematic thing. I mean, again, this is something we saw, for instance, in the episode The Devil in the Dark. We don't understand this form of life. This form of life is different than ours. And so we're legitimately authorized to destroy it for that reason. And that's a remarkably problematic perspective. 